for any listeners that are in transition or considering, you know, taking a leap, like that is such a big piece. Is like, how do we cultivate the trust and and an ability to, if possible, like f- find some appreciation or even joy in the process of not knowing. And I have and I have those moments when that's there, but it's it's such a necessary part of pivoting. So, you know, when you finish a conversation and you're literally like, can I have three more weeks to continue this conversation? Like, I just wanted to keep it going. Did you feel that? Like, Oh, I could have had that conversation for the rest of my life. It felt like (laughs) it was, and I wasn't in it. I was watching and oh my gosh, it was so, so powerful. So we had a conversation with Jesse, Jesse Israel today, who has a, such beautiful story of working in the music industry. And then he has like a, I'm done with that moment, follows his intuition, moves into this beautiful company called The Big Quiet, where he led these beautiful meditations all over the world, which please read more about him or study what he's doing because, oh, what a what a human he is. So one of the things that stood out for me was, and I was around when he was deciding to actually complete the big quiet. So he'd move on to the new part of his life, which is to be a speaker and a thought leader and a author, all sorts of good things. But this moment of like, I know I'm done. I need to move on to the next thing. And to hear him speak to how to make those decisions, how to know that something is done. Oh, I was really inspired. To be in conversation with this masculine energy who was so uh, clear in this is done, but so graceful in the transition and in inviting in his people to celebrate the close of it, right? We celebrate when we open a business, but he also spoke about celebrating how we close and complete something was just such an honor. Uh, so, so, so beautiful to witness. Beautiful. So people, this is a really good episode. I know we love all of our episodes because that's (laughs) what we do. That's why we do those conversations is because we love them. But this one, like this is really, and that might be one you want to share if, you know, with your partner, because a lot of what he speaks of is very much in the partnership and in the, 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 the collaborating with what is around when you have to make big decisions. So enjoy the episode. We are, we're with you. Let's just go listen to it. Here we go. Hello, Jesse. Hello, Katie. Hello, Hi. Sophie. Hello, Jesse. This is really <laughs> special. You are two of my absolute favorite conversations to have in the world, usually one by one. So to have both of you in the room, I'm like incredibly excited. Um, I've known Jesse not as long as I've known Katie, but the kind of friendship where how, yeah, like we know each other really deeply, like we've met before or something. And so um, it's exciting for me. Katie is one of my longest not oldest longest term friend so this is really the um, oldest but <laughs> i've known you a long time is what yes <laughs> so here we go what i'd love to start with jess is if you could share with us a little bit of what's been going on in your life maybe introduce yourself a little bit tell us what's been what's been in the forefront oh i would love to thank you for having me self and katie yeah so um From a career introduction standpoint, uh, I'm a leadership coach and uh, a keynote speaker, and I'm the founder of something called The Big Quiet, um, which was, staying was, because that's a recent development that we'll talk about, (laughs) um, was a a movement that brought mass meditations to millions of people from around the world in really special places. And um, last week, we announced that our nine-year journey of doing that work is complete. Uh, which has been filled with all sorts of uh, emotions and feelings and colors. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah. So, um, so yeah, that, 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 that's how I am from a work standpoint. Um, uh, as a human, um, I, I live in Los Angeles and I was born and raised here. I'm really close with my family. Last night we got together and watched The Bachelor. Uh, my mom, my dad, my sister. It's actually The Bachelorette is episode two. <laughs> <laughs> which is a weird fact that a lot of people don't understand. It's a special family ritual. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and Soph has been coaching me, which has been truly transformative. So to be on the podcast with you, Soph, and to talk about things that you've helped me through 
Mm-hmm. And then to be able to reflect them with Katie and with the listeners is something that I've really just been looking forward to for a while. So really grateful to be here. Beautiful. One of the things that struck me when we first met was how your world have been rich and different. Like I know you started closer to the music industry with the label, and then you kind of transitioned to meditation, which also had a lot of music to it. I'm curious, like, what's your relationship to pivoting? Like, it sounds to me like from the outside, you're a good pivoter. It's <laughs> 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 uh, almost a dance step. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. Morphs, it morphs into <laughs> and then there's a new morphing, which we're going to talk about as well. The new, the third mountain. Yeah. Well, my first real experience with, you know, pivot or transition from a, a career standpoint was uh, about, yeah, it was about 10 years ago. I had started a record label in my sophomore dorm room when I was 20 with, uh, with my roommate at NYU. And we signed a college band called MGMT. They were playing, you know, little frat shows and stuff like that. (laughs) And we loved these guys. We thought their music was so special. And we had no idea what the hell we were doing. But uh, we decided we'd form a record label. The band was on board. And and we really just learned by messing up. But it was cool because the band, after a couple of years, really took off. And it became a global sensation. And all of a sudden, and I was a film film school student, but all of a sudden, I had this, you know, kind of full-time record label thing going on, which is really exciting. And... um, uh, about, I'd probably say about eight years into this journey. So I graduated from NYU and was really going full-time in the industry. I, I, um, I started getting the, these feelings inside that was like a, it was like a pulling, like an, an intuitive sense that I was nearing, uh, a time for change with, with my work. And at that time in my life, I was, so I was, I was in my late twenties. Then I had been meditating for uh, several years. I got into that in my early twenties. It was something that really helped me with all the noise of the music industry. And I found that the more I was meditating, the more not only I was you know experiencing less stress and panic attacks, which is something that I was experiencing in my twenties, but I was I was also able to hear more of my intuition. I was able to kind of hear this like quieter voice inside of me. And that was a really interesting thing to start to build a relationship with. I believe it was it was always in me, but I think because I experienced so much stress and anxiety in, in my young adult life, it was often hard to hear it. So my meditation practice started to almost make space for that voice to come through. So in my late twenties, when I'm you know eight or nine years into my record label, that intuitive voice was really saying to me the growth of this experience with running the record label is, is nearing its completion. You're ready for the next thing. It was honestly really confusing because I, I'd worked so hard on building this, this music company and so much of culture and society said, you got to keep going, scaling, you know, make it as big as possible. Don't stop until you sell it (laughs) or until you (laughs) die, you know? (laughs) And, and there I was having this, this, a feeling in my body that was very different than, the, than you know, what, what my brain was saying or what the world was saying. So that was really my, my first moment, uh, so with like really, with really coming into contact with the conflicting thoughts and experience of pivoting, of transition. It's like there's an internal solo journey that I was on. And then there was like the expectation of the world around me. And in some ways, it, it felt like it, those things really clashed. And that actually made it really hard at first. But when I made the choice to honor that intuitive sense, you know, that, that, that feeling inside of me that said, it's time to move on. And of course, I, I went through a process where I did that. It took about six months. I had conversations with investors and my business partners. And it was honestly really challenging. But when I was 29 years old, I was able to take that leap and, and really step into what was next. And it was really scary because I had no idea what, what was next. No, no sense, really. I just knew what I didn't want to be doing anymore. Mm-hmm. And I just had this, this intuitive sense, which was like my compass. It was like my gut was my compass. And I didn't really know where it was taking me, but it was saying, just go in this direction. <laughs> I'd, I'd love to pause here for a sec, just yeah. because I'd love to hear, Katie, you are so I, often, I, I know I can feel yeah, you're just, just like a horse in the barn. <laughs> yeah, it's very, very exciting. <laughs> <Right. Get in laughs> um, uh, I've never um, met anyone other than my husband, Gay, who is really good at letting go and recognizing when you know when a when a an arc of something is complete and so 
you know, and I hear you know that sensation, that that gestalt inside of you that is saying, you know, time, this is over. And um, and I'm imagining I have this, a similar experience with intuition that um, as I am gotten quiet inside from meditation, I've meditated for like 45 years. Uh, so <laughs> so the meditation space, one of the biggest things that it does is open your own intuition. And my sense yes. is that it also developed more of your inner compass, what you're calling the compass, that let you know when something was finished without knowing what was next. And so I would just love to hear a little bit more about the actual, you know, the body experience, the sensations, the images, the, you know, how did you know that that was a pivot instead of I'm too scared to keep going here or, um, you know, something else is calling me, but I want to keep doing this. And uh, thank you for the context there, Katie. Um, I can relate to so much of what you said. For me, because I was so dedicated to this daily, twice a day meditation practice, the, the more I meditated, the louder the intuitive voice became. And for me to ignore it would mean needing to stop meditating. And meditation was too important to me. <laughs> so I, I felt like I almost, I almost, my body, the experience in my body was a was a, an expansive feeling. You know, it was like it was like an opening. It was like a pulling towards something and it was so strong. And it was the first time I was really confronted with, you know, I, we talk, we, we hear a lot about you know, gut and following intuition. There, I think there's a lot of, you know, beauty in these conversations, but I think this was my first real experience at like a large scale of really honoring it. Yes. And it felt so right when I would lean into that decision of I'm going to make this change. I'm going to leap, even though I'm not sure where it's going to go. So there was something so soothing and warm and pulling like, like a, like a, it, it was the opposite of like a contracted feeling, you know? Yeah. That's just so beautiful because that I, you know, my, my sense is that one of the basic pulsations is either I'm contracting, you know, in fear from life or I'm expanding Expanded, into, yeah. and it's always expanding into the unknown because the next moment is unknown. But what I was getting from what you were saying is that when you chose, when you aligned your action with what you were receiving inside, that you you had a kind of, huh, what I would call it, you know, a relaxed out breath, a sense of, huh, of alignment with yourself that expanded your expansion. <laughs> Spot on. You know, I would go as far to say it was a knowingness. Yeah. It was I just... It was a sensation of this is this is it. Yeah, that knowingness is so different than the, in, the intellectual. This would be good for you. Different. Here are the pros. Right, and cons. right, that, exactly. That knowingness is a deep. You know, it's almost like a a surging. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, uh, it's interesting you said, Katie, like um, pros and cons, because I remember at that time in my life, I actually made a pros and cons list because it was so confronting this whole experience, <laughs> the body sensations and what my mind yeah, was saying. But, yeah. you know? So I made a pros and cons list. And, and I remember the pros list was so much longer. Stay, Sorry, the, the, pro, the, the, um, the pros to stay at the company was so much longer on paper. Yeah. All of these reasons and, and, and you know, valid reasons. We worked hard and there was cool things and we were, you know, and doing some really interesting work. So the, the pros list to stay was really long. Um, the cons list had one thing in it, which was that my heart is no longer in it and it's saying move on. Yeah. So I had to take the, the, the list of one thing and compare it to this very long list of reasons to stay and just honor that, that tiny list. <laughs> yeah. Boy, I just am appreciating the the courage for you to follow that, uh, you know, that inner um, calling. Because, uh, <clears throat> you know, my sense is that's what really, that's what creates innovation, real yeah. innovation. So, you know, because it was genuinely a big leap. Mm. Great, said, great, you know, great reference to the book because exactly. that, I'll, I'll mention it later. But that really has inspired the leap I'm taking now. But we can pause oh, on that. Really? What were you saying, Soph? 
<laughs> well, the one thing you, I caught too that you were saying, because now you're speaking of the, the almost like the debate between your intellectual thought about it and your feelings, but you also said other people, like other people yeah. have a good amount of opinions about to do and not to do, and that it's a failure if you stop the thing, uh, you know, midway. I'd love to hear how you managed that because it's it's a pressure from society that I, I oh, think a lot you know, of people especially experience. close friends or partners or associates. Yeah, yeah. So please. Yeah, well, the experience I had of that with my record label is actually very different than the experience that we're going to get to, the one that I'm having right now. The one with my record label was was unique in that I had two business partners, two co-founders who we started this thing with. Um, you know, when we started the company, one one of one of my partners was a senior in high school. The other one was my sophomore roommate. So we had been on a big 10 year journey together, you know, really like coming into adulthood through this thing. <laughs> So making the choice to move on in some ways felt like, like a divorce um, because they were going to continue running the business okay. and I was going to do something else. And um, that was really, that was really challenging, you know, there. And I, I got to say, I also, I understand um, some of the issues that they had with that. Mm -hmm. I do. You know, and, and that was that was really hard for me to to look at, you know, working really hard on something and having a commitment to investors and my business partners and the bands we worked with and, you know, the various projects we had. And also coming to terms with this, you know, this this deeper feeling inside. So for me, where I landed with that was how do we create a roadmap to get towards where I'd like to go? and have an agreement around what that roadmap would look like. So for us, it was a six month roadmap that involved communication to investors. And, you know, I would come into the office on these days and we would work towards it. And I got to tell you, coming into the office during those six months when we knew that I was going to be leaving, it was really uncomfortable. It, it was challenging. Mm -hmm. um, and to your question, Soph, you know, culturally, it, it didn't feel that that one, that transition didn't feel as tough for me because the company was going to continue on in its, its success mm -hmm. journey. And, you know, I was able to kind of figure out this other thing. So that didn't feel as challenging. That's been more of an issue, you know, with, with my current one. <laughs> but that was, yeah, so that was that was more the logistics of partnership and also like coming into relationship with how do I honor myself and, and these feelings in my body. Mm -hmm. One thing that I'm hearing, Jesse, that I really appreciate is that the the foundation of your relationships and the integrity of your interactions with your partners built the foundation for you to be able to make the transition in a in a well to even to be able to make it, but to be able to honor people's disagreements and to move through that. It was reminding me of the power of what we call recommitting. So like you made this decision, but then you had to recommit to it over and over and over again and then handle yeah. all of the adjustments and the other people's. But but your your guide, you know, trusting your guide and then recommitting to that and then just handling the fallout. Um, I think that it is such a beautiful example to people of what it actually takes to pivot, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. from from something like you're on a big ship. You know, and you want to go in a different direction and the ship's heading that way. And, you know, it's a it's a big deal energetically. Uh, and so I, I was really hearing the the power of your integrity uh, in 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 creating the context for that to happen. Hmm. I really I really appreciate that reflection, Katie, because, you know, in so many ways, just the oh, my own personal experience of trying to navigate to leave or not that that already you know took up so much energy. So. I knew that I had I had to go out the right way, and that was just a whole uh, another added layer of energy to have those conversations. And I, I will tell you, if, if I could go back and do it differently, there were some things I probably would have changed. I could have been more honest in my communication, and I think that uh, I like that I brought integrity to naming it. But it was hard for me to fully say. I'm really leaving. You know, it was a little right. bit of like, a, of course. maybe I'll come back or, you know, I'm going to stay really involved as an advisor. You know, there was some of that, even though I knew it wasn't fully honest. <laughs> so I think I think I did a pretty good job. But, you know, I learned some things from that that I applied. So, you know, my current transition. Well, I was going to say perfect timing. Thank you for <laughs> telling us about this new one, which is about what nine years into it as well. Right. Like those cycles of about nine years, 10 years already. So yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, uh, yeah, okay. 
Um, yeah, well, when I, when I made that leap from my label into what was next, um, I really had no idea what it was going to look like. And, um, I, I knew that meditation was something that had, re had really transformed me. And there was this moment that was happening. This was 2014 where there was this sort of like buzz around wellness culture. And I was living in New York city and, um, there was a lot of intensity there. And I would, you know, when I ran my record label, I'd be at these music festivals to spend a lot of my time at festivals. And I would often go peel off to the side somewhere away from the madness. And I'd, I'd have my meditations mm -hmm. and I'd come back to the festival and I'd feel really great. And with time, other people in the music industry would join me for these little, these little, you know, backstage or away from the chaos meditation moments. And this little group of us formed people in the music industry, sometimes other musicians. And there was something so uh, powerful about this little group of us sharing quiet mm -hmm. during these moments where it was absolute mayhem around us, you know, 10 stages, blasting music and drunk people running around and sun beating down. <laughs> it was really interesting to, you know, kind of sit in that juxtaposition. It kind of felt like, you know, we were, we were the eye of the storm. So when I left my label, I just had this, feeling that I, I wanted to bring more of that to people that I knew. And I would get these little hits of, you know, what if it wasn't a small group of us doing this at a music festival? You know, what if it was the whole festival having a moment of quiet? You know, what if, what if it was something on the main stage? It wasn't just the headlining acts. What if a mass meditation headlined the festival? <laughs> you know, I, I was getting these little pings. Mm -hmm. So I, I just, I just started, you know, kind of following what, what felt exciting to me. And, um, I knew that I had this kind of unique gift for, for gathering people, um, for building community. So I really leaned into it and I brought these two things together that I loved, you know, um, we talk about the zone of genius, which I'm sure we'll get more into, you know, for me, the zone of genius has always re really been about what are my unique gifts and, and, and of those unique gifts, which of those, when I do them, bring me energy yes. and gathering people, and meditating were these two things that just kind of like fit that sweet spot, you know? So I just kind of honored it. And I started gathering people to meditate outside of festivals in my buddy's apartment. He had this big apartment loft in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And um, each month, more and more people started to show up. And because I had left my label and I had all this free time, I was able to really focus on these gatherings. And I had no idea where it was going or what was going to happen. I just knew I wanted to gather busy people to get quiet and then talk about the real things that were going on in their lives. Mm -hmm. And that was it. And each month, you know, it kind of doubled in size. And by, you know, the fourth or fifth month, we had uh, 150 people squeezing in to my buddy's loft to be still together. And I remember having these moments where I was like, what is happening? <laughs> this is so weird. I, you know, I ran a record label for nine years. I was always behind stage. And now here I am you know, gathering and, and speaking about meditation and, you know, sharing vulnerably about my experience. It was very surreal, but it felt very right. So I just mm -hmm. kind of kept following it. And, um, you know, by the fifth or sixth month, um, the big quiet was born through our community as a way to do what we were doing in my buddy's apartment at scale. And we were able to do our first one at uh, Central Park um, at the main stage of their festival, their summer festival. And it was pretty incredible to have that experience. And there I was given a mic standing on this stage, <laughs> terrified. I actually recently was looking at the photos from the first be quiet and I'm, I'm not smiling in any of them. <laughs> like I look so freaked out, <laughs> but it felt so right. You know, it's like Katie, we were talking about the, um, the expansive feeling, you know, the surge of energy. And it was so there, it was so much, it was so much stronger than the fear. And there was a lot of fear. Yeah. And, um, you know, to, to catch us up over the next, Nine years is another nine year cycle over the next nine years. Uh, the big quiet really took off. And, you know, within a, within a year, we were getting invited to bring the big quiet to Madison Square Garden and the top of the World Trade Center. And, you know, under the Blue Whale, the Museum of Natural History, these places that had meant, you know, so much to me as a kid and as a, living in New York and just culturally, it was so cool to witness not only how fast it grew, but that every single thing was inbound every single thing came to my team and i you know into this community you know it was it was wild it was just 
how it was how it was generated. It was such a cool feeling. <laughs> that's wonderful. And, you know, that's what in in TM they call supportive nature. That when you're supportive nature, yeah. Yeah. That 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 gathering. I also just want to. As I know I'm very excited to hear. But also the the power of people sharing essence, sharing quiet space together is just. You know, it is um, uh, valuable enough to really change the world. That yes. that kind of resonance with a group of people, and I've had the experience of meditating with a whole group of people, and you know, it really changes your cells. And so, I, I first, I just want to appreciate you for following that surge of expansion, and then just following it into the unknown, but giving people the opportunity to know that we can find quiet in the midst of anything. Yes. Uh, amen. And you know, it's true, Katie. Um, it's, it's interesting what, what, when I have conversations about the feeling of sharing quiet in a large group, words can't fully do it justice. I agree. There, you know, there's something, it's a felt sensation. Mm -hmm. And I also think that subconsciously we're drawn to it because I was always fascinated by how many people would sign up for our, our events as first timers. And, you know, we would go to a new city and have a thousand people, you know, buy tickets and show up. And they had no idea who we were. They never knew anything about us. I, I always felt like there was something about this idea of mass quiet yeah. that just, you know, on a subconscious level, people felt pulled towards. Mm -hmm. um, and TM has some really interesting studies around how uh, large groups of people meditating together every day for a period of time actually changes things like crime rates in, in large cities. Yes. So, you know, there, there's something, there's definitely something there. <laughs> yeah. I'm, and so your practice is TM? Uh, a ver it's, it's similar. It's, it's Vedic meditation. TM. Yeah. Because yeah. that's, so we're in family. That's so. Yeah. TM is my practice. Yeah. I instantly feel a connection with you, Katie. And I think that that might be part of it because we're, we're dipping into that same field mm -hmm. twice a day, every day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and so many people uh, across the planet. And I also want to appreciate you doing this in the time that you did, because um, the world has been so chaotic, Yeah. Um, you know, in the last eight years or so. And to find a, a you know, what can I do? What can I do? Well, I can go into the quiet and, and that, let that nourish me and then let that connect me with others. And so um, big appreciation for you for your timing. Oh, thank you. Thanks for saying that, Katie. And you know what? I honestly, honestly believe it wasn't me. You know, that felt sense that was pulling me towards making this shift through, out of the record label, that, you know, it was nature speaking through me. Yeah. You know, I, I remember feeling it. I remember getting those hits when I would have the meditations backstage, the festivals, and this this concept to do it at a large scale. It always felt like something was moving through me, and I was sort of a vessel for it. Mm -hmm. And I think the timing, the timing of it, was everything. And that actually has a lot to do with the change and the completion of the cycle. It, I really felt, and I don't know, so if you had a different question, but I could I could lead to that part. No, that's where I was going. I wanted to hear the new, the, the third, the new transition. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, no, no. Well, to, to segue to that point, I, I want to mention, Katie, that, you know, what you were saying about the, the value in finding quiet anywhere and, 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 the, and the ability to connect with that anywhere, anytime um, was a concept that Oprah Winfrey really appreciated. And her team learned about the big quiet when we were on a tour. We were touring the big quiet. That was kind of the, the format that we, we ultimately found. I was touring bands at my label. So touring mass meditations felt like, you know, the appropriate next step. But uh, her team came to one of our events in 2019 in Chicago and they really liked it and they brought it to Oprah and she really connected with the idea. So really what kind of felt like the pinnacle of, of the big quiet journey and cycle was, um, was when Oprah invited us to go on tour with her, you know, she was doing an arena tour at the, in, in 20, the start of 2020. And so it was really cool. She took a huge risk. Um, we didn't have really any, oddly, any footage of me guiding meditations. It was a lot of content of, um, 
our events and our community. So when they when they wanted like tape to see if I was kind of suitable for the tour, I didn't really have anything. It's kind of a funny oversight, but they took a real risk and they said, "Let's just do it." So it was it was very generous and it was so powerful because for a ten week period, we went to cities all over the country, sold out arenas, uh, seventeen thousand people at a time, and you know, Oprah gave me a. A 30 minute stage segment is incredible. You know, I talked for 10 minutes about, you know, the potency of quiet. And then I guided a, an arena meditation for 10 minutes um, with Jackie Cantwell, who plays samples for the big quiet, you know, providing this beautiful sound experience. Mm -hmm. And um, and then Oprah would come on stage and we'd have a conversation about, you know, the things we're talking about. And it was so I, I can't describe. First of all, I can't describe the feeling of getting on that stage for the first at the first tour stop in Fort Lauderdale, I remember stepping onto it and it all clicked. It was like, this is why I had that feeling to leave my label. Yeah. This is why I had this experience running a record label to understand how things like arena shows and concerts work. <laughs> and, you know, and, and being on that stage and being able to connect with the audience and really not just saying this feeling like, the whole arena was connecting with the quiet was actually connecting with the moment and being like, wow, this isn't just about me on stage. This is about bringing this work to people and, and having it really land for them. And so that moment was such a moment of that's why I took the leap. You know, th that's why I did it. <laughs> so I think it took about five years to fully understand it, but it clicked and it was, it was just, it was so special. And the last thing I'll say about it was, the feeling of an arena full of people in total silence is it, it, it's like you can hear the silence and you can feel it in your skin. It's so crazy. Um, it was so cool, but the pandemic kicked in four days after the last tour stopped. Wow. And you know, the last thing anybody could do or legally could do was a gathering, let alone a mass gathering. <laughs> And it really changed things, you know. It really, it really changed things. Of course. And um, we got to do some cool stuff. We got to work with Deepak Chopra and, and do, you know, virtual global mm -hmm. meditations and connect with lots of people virtually. And um, you know, we got to put out our first audio books with Audible. And you know, there was other cool ways we were able to connect with our community. But it's never really the same. Yeah. And after our last tour in 2022. Uh, the fall of 2022, we kind of had a comeback tour after, you know, everyone could gather again. And it was really special. Actually, my favorite Big Quiet event ever happened. It was the last Big Quiet event in New York City on that tour, the place where it all started for us. I didn't know it at the time, but that would be the last Big Quiet in New York. And um, when that tour ended, uh, it was, you know, we're, we're looking at the end of 2022. There was a, uh, that feeling was back. Ah. That, and was that really, feeling, and I'm I'm imagining it somewhere in your gut that that feeling yeah. starts swirling. The feeling, yeah, the feeling was back, and, and if I'm being honest, it, it had been whispering throughout the pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, but it really it really started to feel more clear um, after that last tour, and I remember um, being really nervous to have a conversation with Emily who was someone that I, I brought on to manage The Big Quiet in 2018. And we worked so well together that she became my business partner in The Big Quiet and is really responsible for touring and things like Oprah coming on board and really what The Big Quiet became. But anyways, I was really nervous to, um, to tell Emily, hey, you know, I think we should take a break. You know, there's just this feeling that I'm getting. And, uh, you know, she, she'd been working very hard with me on this. But she said... 100% I feel it too. And it was an interesting sense of relief to be like, huh, by the way, also, also Vedic, you know, TM adjacent meditator, mantra meditator twice a day, 20 minutes for a long time, you know? <laughs> so we were, you know, there was, we were, there was a feeling that was being shared. And um, so we took a break for about a year. And <clears throat> the thinking was, well, let's just take some space from it and, you know, see, see if anything new comes to life. Maybe mm -hmm. there's a new direction for the big quiet or, you know, maybe, you know, maybe something else forms. And, um, going into this year of 2024, I really, it really felt important to me to start to, to, um, to look at it again. 
Just for one year, I just put it to the side and I would just say, big quiet's on break. And it, there was something about it that just felt unresolved. It felt incomplete is the best way I could put it. And I was also, I mean, fully honest, really afraid to look at what I know was there, what I knew was there, which was, which was, God, what will it, what would it mean to say goodbye to the big quiet when the last nine years of my life, my whole identity has mm-hmm. been built around this thing. You know, every podcast I'm invited into, every keynote speaking opportunity, right? Every brand deal, you know, all, all of the excitement from people who want to get together and pick my brain. So much of that, at least the way that it had felt to me at that time, was because of the big quiet. Who would I be if the big quiet didn't exist anymore? And so, you know, there was definitely some ego and identity there. And also it was my baby, you know, I just, <laughs> I loved it. And I was so proud of it. So there was a lot there to look at, but I really dedicated the first couple months of this year to look at that. Self played a really big role in helping me through that. Um, as did my, uh, another coach I work with named Steve Schlafman. And um, uh, the feeling, you know, I remember just having this moment where I really just like made the space to honestly feel into it. And it was so electric, you know, the feeling of let it be complete, say goodbye do it in a way that honors the community and everybody involved and celebrate that nine years and close the cycle. That feeling was so clear and so alive in me. (laughs) And just like we talked about, Katie, expansive surging. And I knew in that moment, this is what I need to do. But the voice got so loud after I I felt clear about that, you know, because I didn't have partners that were going to keep it alive. It was going to be a public closing. And that brought up all sorts of stuff. Shame. What are people going to think? You know, I think, I think when it comes to closing businesses, there's a, I think, I think ending most forms of relationships or most cycles, there's shame. But what, you know, I think especially with businesses as a sole founder, you know, there was a lot there too. And, um, self helped me with this, you know, the back and forths, you know, having moments of feeling so connected to my truth and clarity around it. And then just being so lost and confused. Should I do it? Should I not? Uh, you know, I'm just torturing myself. It was really, really, really challenging. It was really beautiful to watch you, Jess. And that's definitely uh, another opportunity for me to acknowledge you for this courage. Because you you would. It wasn't a, okay, I'm done, ready. Like you really were, I mean, as big as your life is, as big as your feelings are, right? And so you you would have these incredible moments of clarity and that we would hang up and I'd be like, okay, all right, he's, he seems there, that, that feels good. And then two days later, you'd be like, oh my God, I'm like stopping and I don't know and what should I do? And, and it was incredible to, to the honor to be with you while it was happening, knowing that the truth was in motion anyway. Like, we, we, you know, you were going to land, close it or not closing. Like it was this openness that maybe it should stay alive and open for now. And then you'd, you'd hear something else and you'd have the clarity of it. But we knew as we were going through it, as you were going through it, and I was standing by you, there was this, this sense that the truth was going to reveal itself if you stuck with it long enough. Like there was almost yeah. a problem. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, was and, that your experience? Sorry. Go, oh, I, well, I just was seeing the image of dropping a pebble in the pond and then the ripple. So you'd have something would occur and then you would be with the ripples mm. and then something else would occur and you would be with the ripples. And and I, um, I, I'm i mentioning that because I, I think the, the courage to be with being in the wash. Pain. Uh, and until and the clarity emerged from inside. Um, I think that is a, a lesson. It's an opportunity for all kinds of things, but especially people in business who uh, are getting all of that, you know, messages from outside and it doesn't make any logical sense. And why are you doing this? And and to be able to, to ride, um, it's kind of like riding the rapids and then you come out into clarity, but it's a clarity that, that has been organic. And uh, I I think you're modeling that for anybody who wants to touch in even at an energetic level and be able to kind of osmose that possibility for themselves. I think it's a real gift. Mm, ah, that lands so much. The way that you communicated that, you know, it's as, as much as I wish it was just a clean, 
<laughs> it's done. It's time for the next thing. And it's, you know, all smiles and excitement. <laughs> it really, it really was this journey, you know, like self mentioned. Um, and, and like you put so beautifully, Katie, and I think I, I've grown to realize now that we're one week uh, in, into having made the announcement to the world that I really needed the experience of the back and forth. You know, I, I really needed to have those moments of, of serious doubt and really just questioning it. And then coming back to honoring what I felt in my body, I think I needed that because where, where I, you know, I, I have a, a lot, it's only been a week. So there's, you know, there's a whole journey ahead, but one week in, I can say that I've been reminded just in one week, how um, I, I've been so grateful that I honored what I felt in my body. And I've been so reminded that there is such power and potency in honoring that intuition and, and and the wavering in the back and forth was so necessary because it's just kind of helped me even understand more today why the gut is the way, <laughs> you know, it is. <laughs> and I remember saying to Soph a few months ago when I was, when I was in some of the back and forth, I remember saying, you know, I really want to be someone that honors nature's call because that's what it felt like, you know, nature, universe, God, whatever the language is, there was, it, it was speaking through me and it was saying, it's time, this, the cycle is complete. And I remember, I remember saying, I want to be someone that, you know, even though it's scary, honors that and just says, yes, even though all these people are saying, you should try to sell it and you should keep it alive for this reason or why close it? Who knows? Maybe at some point you want to bring it back. You know, I I want to be someone that honors what I feel in my body and what's speaking through me, regardless of whatever else might be out there, because that's just the person I want to be in the world. And I remember when I said that at that moment, thinking to myself, I want to do that, but it feels too scary to fully commit to doing that. And it took me a few months before I was able to be like, all right, I'm going to do it. And and to me, the reminder is it's the way. Yes. And that, um, and again, the, I can hear it in you with the when you landed in an organic way, that clarity just dispelled all of the, you know, the anxiety and the, you know, the back and forth. But but yeah. you let that journey happen to its organic conclusion, which I yes. you know, just really celebrate. Uh, you a know, lot of people in that process, Jesse, have noticed, and Katie, also we've had conversations about this, they either in some sort of denial of what they're feeling and they're pushing themselves through and they're on the other side, okay, now they make a decision, but you can feel that it's not an organic completion. Or they start tackling this thing and their feelings are too big and so they back off and they actually don't do it. Like how often, not often, should I should start that sentence, like not often do I see someone who actually lets the feelings be those big feelings and feel them and continue and feel it more and, 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 and finally, you know, have this, and I'm sure there will be, there will be anniversaries and there will be moments where you'll maybe have another layer that you hadn't caught, but the, the, the grappling with it, what was the, the successful experience from the outside? Not easy, not easy. I know, I know. <laughs> Thanks for that acknowledgement. I really appreciate that reflection self and, Katie, I appreciate your naming of it as an organic process because that was the thing that ultimately not only gave me comfort, but felt most true to me, which is that like everything in nature, there is a cycle and cycles last for different periods of time. We see it in romantic partnerships. We see it in businesses. We see it in menstrual cycles. We see it in, in the growth of, of trees and plants, right? It's, and, and life and death, it's everywhere. And for me to come, ter come to terms with the fact that this is just the cycle completing. Mm -hmm. That's it. What a beautiful thing to be able to, you know, steward forward and to be able to celebrate a cycle completing. Yes. And that felt so right to me. I told Soph once that it felt like when the Big Quiet started, it was, you know, in those early days in my buddy's apartment when it was growing so fast. It was like a, a flower that, you know, bloomed quickly and it grew very fast and the colors were bright and it got a lot of attention and it smelled great and people loved this flower. And the speed at which it grew was just so incredible. <laughs> and then, you know, at some, at some point during the pandemic, the, the petals started to wilt 
And when we did that last tour in 2022, it was still, uh, um, it was a wise flower, but it was wilting. <laughs> and when we took our break for that one year where I just kind of said, let's take the break. I don't want to look at it. The flower went from wilted to fully dried, just fully dried, beautiful, dried flower. Yep. The energy had left. And in that year of saying, let's just take a break. I don't want to look at it. It was kind of like I had the dried flower in my hand and I just was kind of holding it behind my back. And when we made the choice to complete the cycle and last week we made our announcement um, and we did the things that we did to honor it, it felt like we took the dried flower and finally placed it into the soil. Mm -hmm. So it can now, you know, compost back into the earth and provide nutrients for whatever flowers are next for me, for my team, for our community. Um, and that felt really, and, and, and if I'm being honest, like I have some like inklings around the flowers, but I honestly don't really know. And I'm back to where you know I was in that well, previous cycle. The other thing I, I want to really point to is your, um, your comfort with not knowing. Mm -hmm. I think that's such an important skill for all of us is to be able to be friends with not knowing and to not rush through that, to make something that we can feel secure and safe. And, you know, like there's no, ah, you know, what's going to happen. And uh, you're, I think you're also demonstrating a, a way to be with the unknown so that you can be with the cycles of what are really actually wanting to happen through you now. And I think that's an opportunity for each of us to tune into when our cycle's completing for us mm -hmm. and being in the unknown without without trying to you know, make it make it fit uh, before it's ready to fit. <laughs> you know. uh, it lands so much. And yeah, I really appreciate the acknowledgement because and for any for any listeners, that are in transition or considering, you know, taking a leap, like that is such a big piece is like, how do we cultivate the trust and, and, and ability to, if possible, like find some appreciation or even joy in the process of not knowing. And I have, and I have those moments when that's there, but it's, it's such a necessary part of pivoting and transitions, you know, in any cycle. And the other thing that came up for me when you shared that Katie was, you know, in the Vedic worldview, which is, you know, the, the Veda is a body of knowledge that comes from India. TM was born of it. Uh, Vedic meditation, which is what I practice, was born from that. There is this belief system around cycles in nature. Everything in nature has a cycle. And uh, the paraphrase teaching around this is that um, wh when a cycle is starts, something new is created and comes to life. And it's exciting and it's necessary. Evolution is constant. So something is born, it's created, it grows, it's, it's maintained to turn into whatever it's going to become in that cycle. And then it reaches a point where the cycle is complete and there's room for a new creation or for change. Now, what we tend to do as human beings in 2024 is change in cycles completing, too scary. So what we do is we resist the change. The Vedic perspective says that if we resist change for too long, nature will come in with destruction, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and the more we resist it, the gnarlier the destruction gets. Mm -hmm. And we see this, you know, I think one that relates, it's common for, for a lot of people is in uh, romantic partnerships. We stay in a, a partnership that we know is not actually good for too long. It starts to get pretty ugly. We see this, you know, we definitely see this with businesses. We see, we know, we see habits, lots of things in our lives. So for me, it was also a reminder of, of I could see that when I was holding on to it in 2022, like, and, and it was ready to, we were ready to let go. I was noticing things changing, like relationships were going sour, you know, opportunities weren't coming in anymore. Like there was, there was a change and how the energy was moving. And I felt like I was able to see it and catch it a little bit early too. So I just wanted to share that because I think it can be encouragement for people to honor the cycle because if we don't, nature really pushes us to do it. <laughs> I'm, I'm in complete agreement. I've seen that many, many, many times. <laughs> That's beautiful. And Jesse, as we, as we wrapping up this conversation, you mentioned the big leap, which I know was important as you were 
doing your transitions, like what you can tell us about that, but also what else did you do in the process to accompany to like, cause you, you're, you, you're an athlete at this. Like I've seen you hire people, bring people in, build a team around you, the tribe, which I was so honored to be part of, but I wasn't alone. There was a good amount of people around you to kind of really be there for you. I'm, I'm curious to like what the process was for you. And of course, Katie, pitch in any thoughts around this, but how do we build these teams around us? So what do we do to create an environment where at least some of the changes eased? Yeah. Yeah. I've been really excited about this, this dialogue around this. It feels really alive for me right now. It's like, how do we thoughtfully say goodbye or how do, you know, how do we thoughtfully complete a cycle? Um, because we all are going to have these in our lives and there are different ways we can do it with a business. One way to do it is to let it fizzle, not say anything, let the thing be closed Instagram page goes dark website just is untouched and because, you know, gets dusty. <laughs> um, and that might be the way to do it for some people. You know, for me, I felt like I really wanted to um, cele celebrate the completion of the, this chapter and the, and the life of the big quiet. So for me, what that looked like was working with some people to help me navigate it like you, Soph, and like Steve. <laughs> um, and then also going to uh, people that I really respect. Um, I had a conversation with someone named Mike Ventura, who's always been an advisor and mentor of The Big Quiet. And um, he had closed his company of many years. And I came to him and I said, man, I'm not finding much out there on how you say goodbye and you know celebrate and close a company. Like, what's up with that? Like, there's not much dialogue. There's so much around when you start a business. Everybody loves celebrating the start. <laughs> and he gave me some input and I just talked to different people and I just kind of felt into it. And what felt good to me was to make a film that celebrated our nine years and to work with the filmmaker that made so many of our big, quiet films over the years, Alex Colby, who's a very talented filmmaker. And, um, so that was going to be the first, the first piece, even though it felt terrifying. I was like, I'm going to have to look at nine years of footage. And I was already feeling quite emotional and raw, <laughs> but I knew I wanted to make a film that we could use as an announcement to thank our community. And I knew that I wanted to, um, go on like a, almost like a thank you tour and like a, send acknowledgement to the different advisors and team members um, and people over the years that played their roles and create and, you know, helping bring the big quiet to life because it was such a village. So that was really cool to have those combos. <laughs> and um, and then, you know, the, the other piece that was really important um, that was the most probably the most beautiful and challenging piece was letting myself grieve mm -hmm. and mourn the change of the big quiet, which for me meant some really big, ugly cries. <laughs> um, <laughs> Making regular space to cry was a really powerful piece to the completion because what I'll say is I had some cries where I felt like I was really letting go of the big quiet. And those cries were some really big cries around letting go of maybe what I thought the big quiet would be. I never really knew what it would be, but coming to terms with the fact that it was complete. But also it was letting go of um, the recognition that I received so much when the big quiet was, was really on fire. There was a way that I was treated and there was so much sort of inbound opportunities, like I mentioned. <laughs> and I, I loved being um, recognized. It was almost like mini fame or something. The way people would go, you do the big quiet. Oh my God, you, you, we got to get you here and do this and do that. And over the last two years, that really, that really got quiet. You know, like when I, when I, when I took a step back, so did a, a lot of the inbound and the recognition and all of that. So I think in, in a way I was also kind of mourning and crying that part of me that loved to be seen in that way. <laughs> um, yeah. But what I, what I, why I'm sharing this is because on the other side of the cries and the other side of this sort of mourning process, it just solidified this feeling that lives inside of me. That's so strong now, which is a sense of deep appreciation and pride for the journey and for what we all built. I'm just like, so proud of this thing. <laughs> and 
this uh, this deep sense that um, the the big quiet operating and being a thing in the world doesn't actually define who I am. The journey of building it and learning from it and, and offering it and serving it to people, that's all in me. That, that's all formed who I am. And I'm bringing that into everything that happens next in my life. And that's such a beautiful way to be in relationship with it is I wrote mm-hmm. self recommended. I write a letter to the big quiet and I, I ended that letter by saying, you know, <laughs> you like you are me. And we'll, we, we will always be together because it's in who I am and that will be brought to whatever's next. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the journey of those pieces, I think, really allowed me to c- come into a, a, a place of closure. Um, and then the last thing I want to say, because it just feel, it's, it's been so touching, is sharing a, a thoughtful film with the community as a way to say goodbye led to hundreds and hundreds of messages and tributes and people grieving even um, sharing what the big quiet as a community meant to them. And that was the, like, that was the most meaningful way to complete it was to be like, Mm. Oh my God, that's right. As much as it was always felt like it was about me, (laughs) it actually was about the community. And it was so cool to kind of go off, you know, go out on that note. Wonderful. And on that note, um, I am going to um, be um, leaving. Um, I'm, I need to um, leave now and uh, let you all complete. So we love you. So Yeah, bye-bye. Thank you so much for being here. I love this conversation so much. I think we're going to have you. Like, <laughs> we need to do like the third chapter of Jesse. Like, I, feel oh, like I would love that. Thank you for being here, Jesse. Thank you.